This is Scott Richman. And Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie, we are back with our second installment with Mayor John Angan. Scott, it's good to see you. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with him about the future of Missoula. You know, we've, we've touched last week on a number of projects, a number of issues, but we want to go in a little bit more depth about, you know, in five years, ten years, what does Missoula look like? What, you know, what, what's his vision for it? And does his vision, you know, really align with, you know, most people's vision? You're always going to have people who are unhappy. I run into people all the time and said, you know, Missoula is too congested. It's too busy. I like the way it was. Right. And often when you probe about this way it was, it, it's, a, it's a glossed over Hollywood version of the way it was. Right. We always remember things more fondly and with a little more color and a little more, we have a little more poetic license, right? I mean, for example, <laughs> when you get well, that. you know, it was when, when, the, when the mills were going, it was great work. Well, you and I wouldn't live where we were living if the pulp mill was still spewing out the vapors and the fumes right. from the pulp mill. It was the, the air would be filled with, you know, so, you know, right. horrible smells. Sulfuric acid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and when they say, well, the downtown was so, you know, well, the downtown had a few big box stores, but it had a lot of vacant stores when I first moved. This is pre-mall, the, right? This is, well, pre-mall even at the beginning of the mall. The mall wasn't, you know, that. Right, 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 know, right. That, uh, you know, a much of a, uh, you know, a, a draw. It didn't change the nature of the community. In fact, when, you know, in, in the, uh, in the eighties, Missoula ended, you know, basically where the fairgrounds was. That Is was that the end, right. That was the end of the city. And then it was just farms, south. farms and ranches and, you know, that South sort of, Hills farms. Yeah, it was nothing. That's was incredible. Nothing. You know, and, and the truth is we can't really grow. We're, we're never going to be a city of a hundred thousand or 150,000. There just isn't because of the, federal lands and the public lands surrounding Missoula, you can't build, so you can only build right, right. long and wide, so to speak, along the corridor. So the city, you know, can still grow and expand, but it's not going to become, you know, a, a Spokane. I mean, it's not possible. I think it, what's interesting about this next segment with the mayor also is how he sees the city growing vertically, right? And sure. to your point, which is w- where the opportunity lies. Well, you know, you got people coming back, to Missoula, who lived here before. You have people moving here because they have family here. That's right. a lot of the people we're seeing at the old Sawmill District project. But you're also having these tech companies that are coming to town, and they're going to have they're going to be hiring local people. But our our employment rate's pretty low. They're going to have to import people, people that don't have right. a history with the city, you know. And that's a real challenge to bring in new people who don't have a history, and they want the same thing that they have in Portland and Seattle, C- Cincinnati, and you know right. Albany, New York. They want the same chains, the same franchises, and the same comfort right. level. And that does, in some way, change the full nature of the community. Well, and 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 that's how we as a city compete uh, in, in a sense, or become an attractive place for business. Right, right, is being able to accommodate for but that. But as we accommodate business, do we lose our identity? As this river town, you know this this great, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, jewel in, in in the you know the mountains in the Rocky Mountain West. This great jewel of a town. It's still raw and it's still rugged, but boy, they, you're right. They're refining some of the edges, and that's what you're seeing. Sure, and that's what he's talking. That's well, what I want he'll to know talk his. about. He's been the mayor for 13 years. Let's hear what he thinks about the future. Yeah, Mayor John Angan. When we come back from the corner of Ryman and Spruce, Arnie and I spent. A good freewheeling hour and a half with the mayor. And we talk about a lot of issues and you'll hear part two right after this on What Do You Know? Okay, we are back with Mayor John Engen here on Ryman and Spruce. We were just talking about a new ordinance that was passed with the city uh, council on background checks for, to prevent gun violence and be a step forward. Talk a little bit more about Next steps on that. Sure. So it's not a new ordinance, about, about a year and a half old, and shortly after it was passed, uh, Attorney General Tim Fox, in an opinion, uh, ruled that the, the ordinance was uh, uh, unenforceable um, and nullified that ordinance. Huh. Uh, Attorney General opinion without, without an, until a court rules <laughs> otherwise. Um, stands as law, so basically the law was rendered null and void, um, and so we are we're taking that to court. 
um, we're challenging that decision uh, for a couple of reasons. One is um, we we don't agree. And the second is um, th- these become issues of local control and more and more what what the courts are finding is local control has a, has w- a local well control. And, and our constitution provides for tremendous local control. Um, well, I remember the days when there was a sign, hang your guns on, you know, on the post before yeah. you <laughs> right. rode into Dodge, right? right. Rode into Missoula. Right. right. So, so, so this is, this is not only a question of, um, uh, can we enact an ordinance that the community, um, mm. believes is appropriate as expressed by, um, the folks that elected, uh, and the, and the, the second, and I think larger question is, is what is the, what is the role of local government and, and how much control do we have over our own destiny? And we just want to hear from the court. Um, why do you think he, why did, why did he, uh, put a roadblock up? Is it politically motivated? You know, I, I, I don't pretend to, to know the mind of the Attorney General. What I, what I know of him um, in, in my dealings is that he's a he's squared away honest guy. I believe that, that, um, that based on what he was hearing from his staff, uh, the, the ordinance didn't pass muster. Um, we disagree on a number of points. The, the, the law, frankly, the legislation around this, is um, fairly complex. I'm not a lawyer. I spend a hell of a lot of time with them, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, and so what we want is an airing of the facts and, mm. and an understanding of, of, of what the law really is. Um, and the legislature can change those laws at any time. Um, sure. But we, you know, based on what's on the books today, we believe that we had the right to pass that ordinance. And and we're going to get a court to tell us whether we're right in that belief. Mm-hmm. How much time do you spend with the school superintendent? Yeah. Uh, we don't spend a great deal of time together. We, we serve together on a number of uh, boards, uh, and, and Mark is a phone call away or an email away, and we try to collaborate whenever we can. Uh, he just got the Superintendent of the Year, Year Award, Award yeah. and I was able to pop by and congratulate him. He is... He is, um, he's, he's such a voice of reason. He is, um, he is, uh, uh, just uh, honest, straightforward, collaborative. Um, over time, I would like, I would like the municipal relationship, the university relationship, these large institutions, Missoula County, I would like us, I would like us to be able to talk a little more strategically about how we can work together. The fact of the matter is um, everyone has limited capacity today. So, you know, when, when folks suggest that the city of Missoula is engaged in some conspiracy, some days uh, we barely conspire to turn the lights on. Um, mm-hmm. we're, we're pretty busy around here. Uh, school district's in the same boat. And, and when we can take a moment and pause, like we were able to do last week with the university, um, I think we open doors and create some roadmaps for further uh, cooperation that will really get us a long way. So tell our listeners, what's coming down the pike in the near future that's exciting for Missoula? You know, we, we talk sort of shotgun about, you know, all this development and projects, but if you could lay out a, a sort of a picture of what's coming down that's going to be here on the ground, in operation, that's going to, uh, you know, enhance and strengthen the fabric arc of our community. So there's a game changer that will happen on the corner of Broadway, or <clears throat> on the cor- I'm sorry, on the corner of Front, while well, really Broadway, Front and Orange. Um, we'll, you know, our, our development partner will be in the ground uh, at that corner, um, most likely with parking and office um, and convention uh, conference center to follow shortly. Um, pardon me, largest conference center in the state in downtown Missoula in a place where uh, if you were in Las Vegas, they would build a river and build a town around it um, that was walkable and had cool restaurants. So we're talking about the Fox Theater project, right? 
which is which is very complementary to the old Somo district right across on the other side of the river. Absolutely, it's also complementary to everything we to talked about this innovation corridor. And when do we think we're really going to break ground on this on this I think, project? I think we'll be in the ground next spring. Good yep. next spring. And and with that, do we see folks now looking at the river differently? You know, oh, absolutely. And, and talk people, about that. Yeah, people have been looking at the river, I think, differently um, really over the course of the last thirty years and. And um, everything we're doing on that riverfront today reflects that change in attitude. It ain't a dump anymore. It's an amenity. It's, um, it's, it's, it's unique to our place and in some ways helps define us. Um, and so y- you will start to see stuff that um, y- you wonder, why the hell did that ever go up on the riverfront, go away? And like more, parking. Yep, and more appropriate uses will right. come up. My prediction is that this Broadway corridor from about Missoula College to Blackfoot will be much different in 10 years, um, maybe unrecognizable in 10 years. Uh, in a good way. In a good way, Yeah. yes. Um, you know, it'll, it'll be... You know, you, you, you just... You look at all these connections that are that are happening and you look at the energy that Missoulians have around um, uh, around recreation and trails and biking and their ability to get from point A to point B um, they may park their car somewhere but but they like to walk and right. they like to experience stuff um, Front Street look at Front Street the difference between 2010 and today on Front Street that eight-year period Right. Um, well, even it's unbelievable. Well, look at—I mean, look at look at downtown. We're going to have in short order, not too distant future. We're going to have the residence inn open, with several new restaurants and two, three hundred new people staying every single night in downtown Missoula. That's going to make a big difference. Once Rome, the student housing project opens, there will be, will be what. 800 new people living downtown. Some of them are transient because they're hotel guests. Right. 800 people living downtown. Well, it's going to be the re- good for the restaurants and, you know, grocery stores and retail, well, you, culture. Yeah. Yep. What would you like to see downtown, to, you know, that is not there today? Like, what would you like to see more of and l- what would you like to see less of? Uh, I would like to see more housing. Um, I would like to see fewer single-level parking lots. Every parking lot in this community is an opportunity. Every right. parking lot in downtown Missoula is a waste of real estate. Unless they're vertical, we're not using that land appropriately. And you look at you look at pictures of Missoula, um, historic photos of downtown Missoula. Right. Tall buildings are right next to one another, and and we didn't have these surface parking lots. We had great old buildings that that were filled with activity mm-hmm. that went away. For all sorts of reasons, and you know, paradise was paved and replaced with a parking lot. Um, we still need to park cars, but we can do it much more effectively. Mm-hmm. And how is our parking and capacity now? Right now, are we are, are we at close to capacity with what we have? Uh, so, so in addition to the seventy thousand traffic engineers in the city with whom I work, <laughs> um, there are a, <laughs> might be seventy two thousand uh, parking experts. Um, uh, for some folks, there there is not and never will be enough parking, and for others, there's just too damn much parking, um, which is probably a tension that's okay. Uh, it, if you want to do business downtown today, you can do business downtown today. Uh, there is we, we're we're far from a parking crisis. There but, are parking. There are waiting lists, though. For instance, over at yeah, for uh, monthly parking. Well, like if you're going to for lease parking, yeah. for lease parking, yeah. you're going to employ 20 people in the downtown area, and you don't have parking, and you have to be on a waiting list. That makes a decision as to where you move your group. Yep, it's you know, interesting though, Scott, because if you talk to if you talk to Bruce at Submittable, when I say you're going to have 500 employees, where are you going to park him? We don't care. That's not part of their culture. Figuring out parking. Well, you're going to then you're going to need more you're going to need more adjacent housing because. That's important, right? Or transit, or non-motorized, or... Right. Yep. Right, which comes up a lot. There, last year we had 13.5 million tourists in Montana that stayed over four days or five days. That's a lot of people coming to the state. 
Are we getting enough of them coming through Missoula? And if we're not, what do we need to do to get more here? Uh, we get we get a lot of them coming through Missoula. Um, the challenge for me is that we don't we don't we don't capture that in a way that I think we should. You know, people have heard me talk about tourism tax over the years. Um, and I'm still convinced that we, we leave a bunch of new money on the table all day long that folks would gladly pay for the privilege of hanging out in Missoula for whatever period of time mm-hmm. they're here. Um, it would help us it would help us build the infrastructure that those folks use, and it would help us reduce property taxes. Isn't there already a tourism tax, though, or is this a new tax? Well, there is a so there is a bed, bed tax. tax. Right, I'm familiar with the bed tax. Right. Um, so so resort communities, Whitefish, West Yellowstone, Red Lodge, uh, have uh, they're enabled by the state to enact a local option tax. Voters have to approve it. Right. In Whitefish, they've approved it two or three times now because they recognize the value of capturing new revenue from the folks who are using that infrastructure. Um, They're also getting property tax relief as a function of that. Right. And so when you put it to the voters and you educate them around this question. um, And what are they, what is it like, so on a typical uh, hotel bill? In Whitefish, that well, would add what three, well, let's four def- dollars a night. Hold on one second. Let's define what tour what this tax means because it's not just hoteliers, correct? It's other. So, so, so the resort tax is enacted in other communities. Typically, goes to hotel rooms, restaurants, restaurants, restaurant meals, liquor by the glass, right? Uh, rental cars. Not not fuel. Uh, you're already you're getting, already paying you're getting fuel taxes. hammered there. Yeah. yeah. So it's so it's hoteliers, restaurants, alcohol. Yeah, but it's mostly it's mostly on hotel rooms is where you get where where, uh, where it doesn't hurt local citizens very much and well, people that are visiting. There's already a bed don't, tax. Yeah, but it's it's not it's a modest bed tax when you go to places like Las Vegas or New York or whatever. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, 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 or or other small resort tax. No, also. but if you go to Scottsdale, you go to sure. Bend, Oregon. It's it's three, four, five dollars a night. Which, if you got so thousands what are, what are of nights, next, it makes a big difference. What are next steps with that? Uh, so it, so for us to consider uh, local option, for for me to be in a position to put it in front of voters, the legislature has to enable us to do that, mm. and we'll once again talk to the legislature about that and try to make it happen. Um, we haven't had a great deal of success. Hmm. So if. One penny. So, if you did a just a straight sales tax yeah. on everything, yeah, a one penny sales tax in Missoula County would generate <laughs> twenty six million bucks a year. <laughs> I, it's amazing. Well, we have no sales tax. I know. So, it's, but we have we have enough. We have other taxes. I mean, if you want to hear the counter argument, your property taxes well, are pretty. And, you know, and and I'm a Democrat, and the Democratic argument against sales tax has always been its regressive nature. Right. But the fact is, our property tax system is regressive, regressive. and in some ways, now our income tax system is regressive. So, you know, I I'm I'm interested in general tax reform. Yeah. Um, because I hear I hear it all day long. Engen, my property taxes just went up again. When's it yeah. going to stop? Right. Right. Well, you yeah. know, in a place right. that, that attracts a lot of tourists, when you're on vacation, uh, you know, three, four, five, I mean, even $10 a night difference in a hotel room isn't going to stop people from coming. So, Ernie, when you were in Hawaii yes. and I couldn't go. Yes. Uh, how many? You dis- got an invitation, too? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, hey. <laughs> so so how many how many places did you avoid because of the sales tax? None. Right. That's the bottom line. When I go to New York, there's no place I ignore. If you go to Las Vegas, there's no place we I ignore. We don't think about it. You don't think about it. Well, because you're figuring, well, it's a hundred dollars a night for a room and they're gonna slap some What's taxes on or whatever. So it's gonna be one eleven, it's gonna be one fourteen, it's gonna and you just pay it. It's de minimis. Right, but it's just new, and anything it goes back to the thing. Something's new. Well, you have to structure it so it doesn't have too much of an impact on local citizens. Which is which is what that I mean, the local option on mostly tourist related activities, coupled with coupled with property tax relief, real property tax relief, 
is a formula for success. And, right. And it happens in other Montana communities. We were, my, the initial question I had was also about downtown. And, you know, this is the energy center of Missoula. It really is. So what do you see, di- what do you want to see differently? You said housing, infrastructure, and potentially transit. And, you know, you mentioned submittable 500 employees. Well, a lot of them are going to bike and they're yeah. going to take alternative. Right. They're going to reduce their carbon footprint. What else do you see happening down here that really you think a Missoula 20, 2019 20. plus? Yeah, if you, if you like, were projecting 10 years in the future, what would Missoula oh yeah, look like? So our, our idea of downtown will expand. Um, I think it expands west down the Broadway corridor. Right. Um, I think it expands a little bit north and south. You're going to see, you know, single-story buildings and parking lots go away. Um, I think you're going to see Sawmill District as an extension of downtown by virtue of the fact that we'll probably tip up another pedestrian bridge. Um, Because there'll be 800, you know, units, people living there. I mean, that's a lot more people downtown. They're going to, you know, downtown becomes their service So the So the footprint expands. Yep. And more affordable housing is brought in. More housing. Affordable, too. Yep. Um... uh, transit infrastructure. How about businesses? Because one of the one of the things that I think we, as a common conversation, is small business is starting to get squeezed, continues to get squeezed because they can't afford to be downtown or they can't afford yeah. to be. You know, we're they're they're competing against Amazon and they're competing against Zappos, and you can't. You know, shoe stores and gift stores are going away. And in place for banks. Yeah, we have a mall agents. that was somebody bought for twenty six million dollars. They thought it was a good investment. Yeah. Fifty six. Yeah. Fifty six. Yeah, fifty six. Excuse me, fifty six. So, so talk talk a little bit about that. Right. <laughs> sure. So 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 if if you roll down Higgins Avenue, you're going to see um, you're going to see shops that provide what Amazon cannot, and that is human relationships and customer service and expertise so uh, I think if you talk to Anders at Runner's Edge ain't, ain't nothing he sells in that store that you probably can't buy on Amazon and have delivered tomorrow by a drone or whatever um, okay. but the fact of the matter is a whole bunch of people go to Anders because they have a relationship with him he understands his product he understands what the product is used for and he cultivates those well, relationships. plus if you're here as a tourist you're not right. going to order from Amazon. You're going to want to go and say, "I want to go running. I didn't right bring the right shoes. I want a, I want a collapsible walking stick." I mean, you're not going to. But order you, but that. Th- but that begs the question: Does everybody in Missoula really want this to become a, a much bigger tourist uh, destination? But it's, it, I, and I think it's a. So I started the four heats of the Riverbank Run. I don't know, eighteen hundred people ran all told in that. Um, my hunch is that a whole bunch of those folks bought their shoes from Anders. Right. Um, and they're folks who live right here because they want an experience. Not not everything is a commodity, even though it's been commoditized. So, uh, you know, I can, I can, you can order a restaurant meal. Um, as far as I know, you can have brain surgery on the internet now. But there is always going to be a place <laughs> for small business, I think. Provided that they're agile, that they provide great customer service, right. they operate in a niche. And there's some things that you want to buy locally, local crafts and right. things that are not on, you know, that you wouldn't know to buy on Amazon because you haven't come to if Missoula you yet. Keep, right. If you want to keep steak from Missoula, you pop into the hub or you pop into yeah, you your roots. I understand that. Right. But, and that's nice, and that's in support of a tourism Kind of right, business. and you had mentioned that question: Do we want more tourists? Right. Well, that's that's, that's question one: Is do we want do we want it to be a, more of a tourist destination, a la Whitefish? Right. Well, that's a question. Well, the, well, the, the, it's, well it's, it's, it's it's but they're separate questions. The fact is, the tourists are already here, and so <clears throat> we're you know it, by capitalizing on those visits, we're we're not turning into a tourist town. We're taking advantage of the fact that. This is a tourist destination. Right. As long as as long as the you know U.S. domestic tourism is increasing, so many people want to see their country before they travel abroad. And right. With you know cramped airlines and all that, there's you know there's more interest. 
And if you're constantly listed on the you know, 20 best river towns or the 20 best... You're going you know, to be a tourist destination. You're be, I know you want that. to come take a look. I, I think there are a lot of people, again, it's back to people not feeling comfortable with right. where, well, where, so where what, we're going. Right, but then what do they want it to be? That's right. Well, that's my question. What do, what, when you hear that pushback, what's the, what's the, what's the answer? What, are they, what should we be if we're not... Well, well part of it is, you know, I could say this and the mayor can say, you know, more, you know, more of a diplomatic way. You know, there's this whole myth of the good old days that never were. There are a lot of people as you lived here your whole life. Missoula back in the seventies was not really the place that everybody wants it to be, right? right? A lot well, of boarded up stores downtown. Yeah, and if you if if you look at Higgins Avenue today, there are more local businesses doing business on Higgins Avenue today than there were when I was a kid. Mm. J C Penney was downtown. F W Woolworth was downtown. Uh, what became Macy's, Macy's the right. Bon Marche? I, th- that was a chain store, right? There are there are more local businesses making it in downtown Missoula today than there were when I was a kid. Right, and you have a, a nice influx of restaurants. Yeah, well, and- when I came here twenty years ago, there was not the kind of diversity in the restaurant right. area. Well, well, the thing is, this is is if you bring in more skilled labor and you bring in more high tech jobs and more higher paying jobs, they're they're going to demand more services. Right in town, because that is what they're used to. That's what they're. Com- you're competing with Seattle and Portland and all these other places. And, and younger folks, <clears throat> you know, not every consumer decision is based on whether I can get it tomorrow via Amazon. They want an experience as well. Today, by the way, with Amazon, we, we, yeah, just, right. we just came back with from an East Coast trip, and it's incredible all the vans right. that oh, are yeah. Amazon vans. Well, I mean, look, they're we, doing same day drop off. We just opened a new dinner theater, and I've, I, w- I went there for the first time. The AMC. Yeah, and and they said they're doing slamming business. The only thing I recommend to you guys, if you haven't been there, is the menu has how many calories for each of the things. Yeah, that's, it's that's it's to be shocking. It's shocking. I was like, they, oh! they post the calories. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I so don't a milkshake to... is like six chocolate milkshake, sixteen hundred calories. So anyway, but, that, but putting that aside, right. you would not think with all the availability of instant online on demand media that people would still want to go and go. go to they want age. that experience, right? Right. And it's that's why IMAX is so popular. So let me get back to the to you know maybe the last this last question or this last stream of thought. What does Missoula twenty twenty five really feel like and look like? If, if if your if your vision comes to pass, I, th- I think it I think it looks a I think it it feels a lot like the way it feels today, um, but I think I think more people have better jobs and are more satisfied in those jobs. Um, I think more people have access to housing, and I think that um, that we have a, we have a, a better tax base that allows us to take care of our community as it grows. One last question. We, we joked about this a little bit at the outset, but you do have detractors, right? We do. You do have people that are... What? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get every vote this last time. I saw that. You, you did well, though. <laughs> but you do. And we've talked about this, uh, you know, when we've spoken in the past. How can you help build the bridge to them, right? Like, you know, look, there's a point of which... People are just going to be negative because they want to be negative and they believe that they're right and whatever you yeah. say is conspiratorial or whatever. But if you put that aside a little bit, if you focus on housing costs too much, the taxes are going up yeah. here, that kind of thing, you know, how, how, do, you, how, how do you address that because there in are, a constructive right, way? Right, in a constructive way where, you're, where you are building a bridge to some of these, not building a bridge, bad metaphor, building a, connecting with more, with more people, bringing more people under the tent. Because I do feel like there is a bit of a disconnect, and I think people are so quick to rush to judgment. Oh, he's doing this. And we've talked about this. Yeah. You know, It happens on my station. We have my listeners are like, he's going here, he's doing... How do you, how do you bring them in? Because you, know? you can. It's possible. But how do you do it? Uh, so with, with limited time, limited resources... I have to I have to spend most of my time working on the stuff that matters to the eighty percent of the people who believe that this ain't a bad place to live. I will always acknowledge constructive criticism for for many folks, unless I can have a direct conversation with them. 
that that that's a that's a big deal, right? And um, there there are there are people in public life who, who of whom I have an impression that may be completely wrong just because what I read or what I'm predisposed to think about that person based on their political party, based on what they do for a living, based on one thing I read that may or may not be true. Um, fact of the matter is that I'm going to show up every day, do my best, be honest, forthright. Um, I will make mistakes. I will acknowledge those mistakes and move on. I will take risks. Um, and sometimes those risks won't have the reward. Uh, <clears throat> but um, You're very I, accessible too, though. That's I the thing. try to be. You are accessible, and that's the thing I think people don't, they don't give you credit for. Well, if, if uh, you know, my, my calendar is pretty full of conversations with Missoulians who want to do a wide variety of things, ranging from I had a, I had a meeting with a, with a woman who brought a new acupuncture business here because she wanted mm. to talk to the mayor. Um, and I, I was happy to have that conversation. I hope that it was helpful. It provided me some insight. I've had conversations with people who suffer from mental illness who are deathly afraid that um, that cuts to their services are going to render them out on the street. And we have those conversations. Um, I have conversations with folks who have a beef with the police department. I have conversations with folks hmm. who have beefs with our development services department. Um, and licensing. And licensing. So it's not just all about business. We try to solve problems. My job here every day, how do I make a life better? How do I solve a problem? Sometimes I can't. Sometimes the best I can do is listen. Sometimes, and, and there is, while I have a lot of responsibility and, and a level of accountability, there's a lot that's out of my control. Um, right. I do my best to control what I can. Yeah, because we focus so much on business and services in town, but we don't. We, well, we didn't talk about, about each, mental health. We didn't talk about right. opioid addiction. We didn't. Talk, I mean, and that all falls into the into the fabric of the community. Yeah. Right, and uh, absolutely, and you know, you look around here, you see a whole bunch of uh, medical marijuana places popping up, right, because of the laws that changed in the state, yeah. and you do have an opioid crisis, and. I don't know that it necessarily has hit Missoula like it has other parts of the country. Yeah. Well, yeah. I serve, <clears throat> I serve seventy thousand citizens. I talk to a very small percentage of those citizens, but I have to serve them all. So, so I have voices in my head. Hard to believe, <laughs> but I have to remember. I have to remember when I'm making decisions. I have to remember it's not just the person in my ear; it's the person who's sleeping in a car who has no idea that they can have a conversation right. with the mayor. Well, you serve more than seven because twelve thousand students show up here in town. Well, and, and I serve the metro. You know, the yeah. folks who commute here every day. Right. Yeah, I mean it's. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing we didn't bring up, and I know we want to wrap up, but we have a beautiful, two great hospitals in this town. Fantastic. Health and you've got, system. yeah, and you've got some great health services yeah. that are popping up um, as well. And that's something that we, I, I would say, I would submit to both of you when you compare us to other towns and, and cities in Montana, they can't hold a candle to this no. place. No. So, but the other thing I just want to talk is, is that, being a mayor of a town is one of the more difficult jobs because, as John just pointed out, he has 70,000 students, he has uh, 70,000 citizens. citizens. Students, visitors, you know, people driving into work, um, tourists, and then you're part of a state with its laws and regulations and rules, and then you're part of a nation that has, so you got federal rules, state rules, county rules, municipal rules, and you're sort of at the bottom of the pyramid trying to manage this with all of that other things on top of you. But we get the most done. Right. Local, at the local, local level. Government. Local government is where it's at. Yep. Just like local business is where it's, it's at. It's the <laughs> sexiest place to be because you get the most. And your office is the sexiest office in town. And John yep. John Angan, mayor of Missoula, Montana, thank you once again for My pleasure, sharing gentlemen. your insights and your uh, vision. It was a good conversation. Thanks for coming to thank see you. me. Arnie, that was a good freewheeling conversation with the mayor. Yes, we covered a lot of topic with him <laughs> and two visits. And two solid visits. Yes. But today we have a, a special guest in the studio, my 91-year-old father, Dr. Albert Richman, from Florida, all the way up from Boca Raton. Dr. Richman, how do I look? 
Do I look okay? Terrific. <laughs> good. That's, that's good to hear. So, so the mayor in the show talked a lot about tourists coming here and making Missoula, you know, a, 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 a jewel of a city, a gem of a city. You've only been here twice. What's your impressions of Missoula as you come here? Visit your son. I happen to love it very much. And where are you coming from? Coming from Florida, Boca Raton, Florida. And how does this compare with Boca Raton? Other than the temperature, it's beautiful here. I love it. The weather has been excellent. And is there enough to do? Because lots of times people come here from the east and say, there's nothing to do here. Because we don't have the hustle and bustle of, you know, a, a, a metroplex a mi- like South Florida. Do you think there's enough to do here? Do you, are, are you be able to It seems to be the case. Yes, absolutely. Dad, how long did it take you to get here when you went flying? Was it easy to get here? It was easy enough, but it took a long time. Right. Because we had to get off in, first in Minneapolis. Right. And then fly down yeah. here. Well, it's 2,500 miles. It's a long way to South Florida. From yeah, there. so it took time. Right. Took almost a whole day for us, but the trip was fine. And the airline was okay? The, the, the airline was okay? They treated you right? Excellent. Dad, for for our listeners, because we have people that are also outside of Missoula, t- tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from originally? I am originally from Brooklyn, New York, USA. Okay. <laughs> the home of the Dodgers, and it always will be, right? The home of the Dodgers. <laughs> And I watched them play many, many times in the old days. At Ebbets Field. At Ebbets Field. Did you ever live anywhere else? Beside Boca Raton and Brooklyn, where else did you live? I lived in Jersey, New Jersey, for quite a while. Fantastic. Uh, Where in New Jersey? Well, Woodbridge, New Jersey. I had an office in Woodbridge. New Jersey. And what did you do for a living? I was an optometrist. For 50-something years, right? Well, about 55 years. Were you a sole practitioner, or did you have other optometrists in your practice? No, I was a sole practitioner and enjoyed it immensely. I made a nice living and... You have a nice pair of glasses on, so you know what you're uh, you know what you're doing. <laughs> but Dad, let's for our listeners, okay? Let's we're going to tell a story about you. So you're an optometrist from Brooklyn, New York. Moved to Jersey. Went to college where? Well, my first college was Brooklyn College. Okay. Then I was drafted into the army, and what it year? Was just after World War Two. And but the GI Bill took care of my fee for optometry school. And how long did that take in those days to go to optometry school? Well, because I had had the uh, Brooklyn College background, it took me only three years through optometry. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Dad, where did you go to optometry school? Chicago, Chicago College of Optometry. And you liked that. That was a good school. I loved it, and I loved Chicago. So did you sneak out, instead of going to class a few days, and go to see the Cubbies at Wrigley Field? I don't know if I did that, but I saw them very often. <laughs> well, they only played during the daytime. <laughs> but what was the thing in Chicago? This is the, the other thing is that what was the big thing with music? Right, and he was a clarinetist. Ah. So you played the clarinet, but what did you love about Chicago, that music I scene? Loved, well, it wasn't just the, you know, I played the clarinet in the Army. Okay. That's how I spent my Army career. Right, okay. In a, in a band. So I continued to play it. I do 
to this day, still play it occasionally. And it's good. And uh, who are your heroes? Who are the heroes that you loved in music? Oh, Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw. I knew you were going to say Artie Shaw. Everybody liked Artie Shaw. Well, that that was the they, they were the um, you know the uh, Justin Timberlakes of the day. Of course, we were pop. Oh, there was pop yes, music. Absolutely, pops. Quick question for you. So you live in Jersey. You 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 are an optometrist. Okay, and, uh, you know you are also a, a big tennis player, right? You're a good athlete. I was a big tennis player for a long. Well, he's time. still in great shape. Yeah, he is. For 91, he's still moving pretty spry. That spry there. How and you know what and and why are you here in Missoula? Tell us why you're here. What are you here for? I'm here to spend time with you, my <laughs> magnificent son, <laughs> good father. And there's then al- <laughs> there's also some other event happening. Yeah, isn't there? we're going down to Bozeman for a uh, a graduation. Oh yeah, that'll be a beautiful deal. Right, yeah. Lewis, my oldest son, and the first of his generation graduates college. Well, one thing I want to add, you want to tell them, you, you're a proud father. Tell them about the, the lacrosse season for the Montana Bobcats. Well, by the time this airs, Arnie, yeah. we will have gone to the national championships. Uh, the nationals, but uh, And so we don't know what's going to happen there. We think they'll do pretty well. Probably, I don't want to say what they'll you do. Don't jinx them. Anyway, as you know, my son, when he moved here in 2013, the one thing he had with him, because he wasn't happy about being here because he moved his senior year of high school right. from New Jersey but one of the things he had, which was really uh, special to him, was and his brothers was lacrosse, and he played four years at uh, at Montana State and did really well, and very proud of him. And you know, they beat they, some tough schools. Who they beat on their way to the national championship? Well, gosh, they beat um, a couple of the schools in Denver: MS uh, University of Colorado, Denver uh, College of Mines. Um, boy, they played. Uh, I'm trying to think who else they they beat. They built. They, I mean, look. Well, they beat everybody because they're going well, to the championship. Well, they, they became the Rocky Mountain Lacrosse uh, uh, League uh, champions, right? Champions, and now they're we're going to the nationals. But by the time this airs, we'll have a uh, nice. we'll, we'll have a national champion. And hopefully, it will be the Bobcats. It'd be great if it could be. I mean, they are a good team, but they have some stiff competition, especially from some of the schools in the Midwest. Yes. But anyway, pops, we're glad that you came in. Dr. Richmond, it's a pleasure to see you again. You're looking very... Pleasure, pleasure meeting you fellows. And And any parting words for our audience? (laughs) Do as you best can. (laughs) That's good advice. That is good advice. All right, Arnie. Thanks, Dad. See you next week, Scott. See you next week, Arnie. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO. 